Today's event is the fourth in the Designing Our Future discussion series on which the Embassy has partnered with the US National Science Foundation and Axios. Together, we discussed important themes, including the future of mobility, clean growth and climate change, and artificial intelligence. Our goal with this series is to explore some of the big technological, economic, and policy challenges that are confronting our rapidly changing world. We've managed to attract a distinguished range of speakers to these events, and today's panel, which will address the theme of the future of health and medicine, is no exception. So first, let me say how very grateful I am to all of today's panel for sharing your expertise with us. I am acutely conscious that in current circumstances, you must all be under relentless pressure. So your readiness to find the space to fit today's event into your crowded schedules is, is very much appreciated. I also welcome the fact that in addition to the formidable lineup of, of US expertise on the panel, we will also be joined today by Professor Chris Whitty the UK government's chief medical advisor. I remember almost a year ago today, we, we took the decision to postpone the third event in this discussion series at the onset of, of the pandemic. And although a sense of the gravity of the global health crisis was, was rapidly becoming apparent then, I think it's fair to say that few at that stage foresaw the scale and longevity of, of the crisis that confronts us in relation to COVID-19. Developments that are taking place around us have underlined the urgency and importance of a key theme of this discussion series, addressing the global policy challenges of a rapidly changing world. The COVID-19 pandemic has transformed the world in ways that I certainly did not imagine this time a year ago. It has led to the tragic loss of life in countries around the world and its severity has been a very stark example of the challenges and threats which as societies we face together. As the past year has made clear, a unified global response is essential to bringing the pandemic under control. And this will be a major theme of, of UK government efforts, including in our role as G7 chair in 2021 and as a major contributor to COVAX. But through this tragedy, there has also been hope, inspiration and innovation. The news this week of the FDA's latest approval uh, of a further vaccine is just another example of the remarkable advances in, advances in vaccine development and testing in the past year. That has only been possible because of the incredible work of medical experts, researchers, scientists, and indeed business. And with today's panel, we have some stellar representatives of those professions. So let's get straight into the discussion on, on the future of health and medicine. And for that, I'd like to introduce Alison Snyder, Managing Editor at Axios, who will lead the discussion and introduce our panelists. Many thanks. Thank you to the Deputy Ambassador and thanks to the British Embassy and the National Science Foundation for host, co-hosting this event with Axios. Um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed science, it's changed medicine and public health. And today we're gonna look at the lasting impact of those changes on how healthcare is delivered and how medicine is developed. And so to do that, we have a great panel, um, including Chris Whitty, who is the chief medical officer for England and the UK government's chief medical advisor. Dan Baroque, who is the director of the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and has co-led the development of uh, the Janssen, jo Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Romy Amaro is a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego, and directs the National Biomedical Computational Resource. She and her collaborators are working to model SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 and its behaviors as it hosts, infects host cells. And Jeff Spader is the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer at IQVIA, which provides advanced analytics and contract research services to the life sciences industry. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you um, to everyone who's watching online today. Please submit your questions for the panelists via the Q&A window, as Josh uh, mentioned earlier, and I'll pose them throughout the discussion. So again, thank you all for being here. And I wanted to start um, with where we are today, which is that each of the countries represented here now have three vaccines that are authorized for use. Um, they're all effective against severe disease, um, but they're also not all the same, they're different. And so I was hoping that you could speak, um, maybe Dan, to start about how they should be used and how people are thinking about how they should be used um, in these next coming months. 
Sure. Well, thank you, Allison. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today to be part of this discussion. Um, the creation of not one, but multiple COVID-19 vaccines throughout the world, and there are some in the US and the UK and Russia, China and other places, the development of multiple COVID-19 vaccines that are safe, that are all safe and effective in just about a year is, is a remarkable accomplishment of science that goes well beyond the teams who have worked on those specific vaccines. Uh, but really is a testament to decades of advances in virology and immunology and vaccinology uh, that really culminated over the last year when there was such a global need for the development of these vaccines. <clears throat> in most cases, these vaccines I would see as largely interchangeable, uh, that um, uh, there, there is obviously a tremendous amount of discussion about the differences amongst the vaccines, um, either in, in formulation and format and efficacy and safety. Uh, but fundamentally, all of these vaccines, the, the, the most important message is that all of these vaccines are safe and all of these vaccines are effective. And all of these vaccines are stunningly effective against the outcomes that matter the most, which is severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. So I think that in terms of how they should be deployed, I think that uh, there, is a, there is a global need to accelerate the vaccine effort on both sides of the Atlantic as well as throughout the world. The reason is not only to protect people and their families and their communities, but also we need to accelerate the vaccine rollout to prevent the emergence of more worrisome viral variants in the future that potentially could be even more worrisome than the ones we have today. So in my view, that's actually the single most important reason why we need to get the entire, uh, the, the entire uh, population of the world vaccinated. So what we need is actually all the vaccines, uh, all the vaccines to be deployed as quickly and effectively as possible. Chris, can I ask you to talk a little bit about how the UK is approaching this? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that I completely agree with all of what uh, Dan just said now, then. Um, in the UK, uh, we've um, obviously gone for a very slightly different approach, but it really is a slightly different approach, which is we've delayed the second doses of uh, the vaccines we got available, which all the ones in the UK are two dose vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson one, obviously, is a one which the US has just approved as a one dose vaccine. But we've delayed the second dose, and it is for exactly the reason that Dan has given, which is from our perspective, the key thing is to get as many people as possible vaccinated. Uh, and what the data uh, showed to us is that the, uh, the majority of the protection, but not all of the protection, comes from the first dose, at least initially. And that therefore, this was a way of getting a larger number of people vaccinated very rapidly. And you could debate this either way, and uh, there are perfectly good arguments in both directions on this. What we would all agree uh, completely, and I don't, and the differences really are quite small, uh, is that we want to get as many people as possible vaccinated as fast as possible, and that for all the two, two dose, dose vaccines, we absolutely need to have everybody vaccinated twice. And I think the rest is to some extent at the margins, if I'm honest. Uh, in the UK, we've uh, managed to get uh, over 36% of the adult population is now vaccinated with one vaccine, many fewer with, uh, with two. The US has taken an approach which has got a large proportion with two and, and a smaller proportion with one. And I, I, I don't think these differences should be properly magnified. Uh, the key thing is everybody should get any vaccine that's available as soon as possible. That's how we get on top of this epidemic. So the vaccines, of, uh, the rapid development of them has certainly been the science story of the year. And some people say it'll be the science story of modern times. Um, and so I'm curious, what, um, what's next for these technologies? You know, what, how can they be used for both for COVID-19, but also for other diseases like cancer that the world is struggling with? And what stands in the way of the technology? Was that to me, Alison, or to someone else? I, you can, yeah, just start, you could start, yeah. Well, and I think, I, I mean, the, the, it is an astonishing scientific story and obviously built on many years of research. So this is the final uh, stage for this disease, but uh, this, this goes, you know, decades of work by many, many thousands of people have led up to this research. Um, in terms of, uh, there are several diseases which I think we could be using in, for infections, which we currently don't have vaccines for. So that's the, the most obvious path. But as you imply, 
uh, there may well be um, some cancers that we could actually use, not just to prevent an infection that causes a cancer. We have those already uh, for, uh, for example, cervical cancer or liver cancer. We have uh, uh, vaccines against the infections that drive them, but in due course, potentially to target the immune system to treat cancers. And, and the RNA vaccines, which have been such a breakthrough in this, uh, pan this pandemic, um, uh, were actually in many ways designed to be used in cancer therapy in due course. And that is an area which I think is very uh, exciting. We're very confident that the immune system is critical to treating cancer. And there are now a lot of drugs that are involved in that. The idea of vaccines that could be used against cancer have been around for a while, but we haven't yet made them work. The hope is that this has given a kickstart to this field and that we can actually accelerate uh, this area of, of, of treatment. I want to ask Romy, um, so you and your colleagues have brought together a lot of supercomputing resources to, to study this virus. Um, and I'm curious what other questions um, that can be turned on and what sort of are the, the hurdles, I think, to pooling together these resources to look at other, whether it be other viruses or, or diseases? Um, yeah, that's, those are two very good questions. So I'm gonna answer your second one first. I mean, in terms of what sort of advances can be turned on or what kind of resources can be turned on, I think this uh, SARS, the, the COVID-19 pandemic really exposed how agile the scientific community can be with regard to allocating resources more nimbly. Um, in particular, in the area of supercomputing resources, it was not only, there was a very, the large consortium that formed by pretty much everyone, everyone who had compute resources available, um, not only in the US, but then also globally to make these resources available and, and very quickly to the scientific community. And that was fantastic. I mean, and then there's certainly a lot of uh, basic science questions you heard already from Chris and from Dan about the importance of the basic science side of things, especially for catalyzing the discoveries that are going to, uh, you know, result in sort of new therapies and therapeutics in the future. There's a number of things that can be done there in terms of trying to explore the different sort of molecular piece parts of the virus and how those piece parts interact with various components of the human body. A lot that can be done there. Um, I'm particularly interested also in using these types of approaches to um, these computational approaches to get insights where experiments can't go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot that can be done there. One particularly difficult place, I think, in, that has sort of uh, shown itself in a, in a couple of different ways, it has to do with um, the airborne transmissibility of this virus um, and what happens to the virus when it's in the aerosol phase. It turns out that is, um, that is actually something that's difficult to study experimentally, but together with computing, I think we have a chance to really get a better understanding of what's happening in these sort of unique environments. Um, and these sort, of just, these sort of basic science understandings, I hope will help provide evidence that will drive um, uh, new strategies or improve strategies for mitigation and so forth and prevention. So um, these are some of the scientific advances, I think that are sort of with an eye towards the future, but it's also like, as you've all alluded to, it's really changed how research and clinical trials and medicine is, is done. Um, and Jeff, I was hoping you could talk a little bit sort of, you know, the pace of scientific publishing in particular has rapidly increased in the past year. I mean, do you think that's here to stay? And I guess, what are the potential drawbacks of that that you, you've seen already and, and anticipate? Yeah. So. You know, speed is is something that uh, <clears throat> if there's a if there's a silver lining of this of this outbreak, and I, and I hesitate to even talk about silver linings given that this disease has affected people around the world and caused mortality and disrupted e economies. So it's 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 somewhat um, uh, uh, dark to say that there are silver linings, but but a, a couple of them are number one the speed of development of these vaccines and and and, and therapeutics. I mean. Dan and his, I don't know exactly when, when Jansen talked to you about, uh, about getting, using the adenovirus type 26 uh, 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 vector, uh, but it was just about a year ago, right? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit earlier. Um, so the speed with which things are developed is just unprecedented. And I, I think in some, some respects, we almost take it for granted that any vaccine will work. And, and it's clearly not the case. We've seen some vaccines that didn't. So 
it, it is amazing that the speed happened. And that, that speed was, was driven by a couple of things. First of all, the academic research and biopharma and, and, and governments worked together in a collaborative way that um, was really unprecedented. Um, the second is um, people took risks. Instead, you know, the, the farm industry tends to be relatively conservative for good reason, because you, you, you want to be conservative in terms of bringing new therapies and exposing people to unproven therapies. Uh, but there was a, a risk taking element in doing things in parallel, which had not been done before. And part of that was government incentives, but also I think part of it was, was the, uh, was the um, uh, fiduciary responsibility of, of, of these organizations. And then Allison, the, the pace of research, especially published research, was just amazing. I went back uh, and looked uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the two decades before the coronavirus outbreak, on average, according to, to PubMed, there were about 500 to 800 publications a year that included the term coronavirus. Last year, there were over 65,000. I mean, it just, it orders of magnitude difference. And I think it, part of what happened was that there was such a dissemination of information. And we've got some of the people here that were publishing those things. Um, and that's great. There is some downside, right? The downside is not everything was going through a peer review process. And we all know even the best researchers, sometimes they make mistakes, they overlook things, they make assumptions that they shouldn't. And that peer review process helps refine that. We didn't have that in this place. And I think it was reasonable to send out as much information as possible, but you had to be discerning about how you interpreted the data. Um, and, and, and that, I think, speaks to, to a fact that just scientific literacy, and especially statistical literacy, is probably something that decision makers and the public need more of to be able to interpret these, these data as they're, as, they're, as they're coming out. And, and, and to acknowledge that not everything that comes out of print is going to be perfect. In fact, we know, you know, talking about p-values, some of them are just wrong, right? I mean, we just know that from a statistical purpose. So I think this has been, you know, the speed with which we did things was amazing. A lot of that had to do with the dissemination of information. Most of that was positive. Uh, some of it uh, required some discernment to really understand and to put things into context. We've also seen clinical trial design sort of be adjusted um, in some cases to facilitate speed. And Chris, I wanted to ask you about the um, the Oxford AstraZeneca trial in the UK um, I, and sort of if you could talk a little bit about the decision there to okay that design, which has faced some criticism. Um, so what I guess the what was the dis, how was what was the thought process between, behind the UK regulators um, approving that design and those changes in that design? Well, I mean, I think there were two things to say about this. I mean, the first of which is, I mean, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which is like the others, a great scientific triumph, was built on a lot of years. And what the, the thing it came out of was after the Ebola crisis, we looked at all the diseases that could have had vaccines and didn't. Uh, and one of the ones we looked at was MERS, and uh, which is another coronavirus, Middle Eastern uh, coronavirus. Uh, and the program in Oxford was aimed at the MERS coronavirus and then was pivoted over to this. Now, of course, it's an academic group, not a not a gov not a um, uh, an industry group doing this. So they did it as academics do it, uh, but they did it very fast and very effectively. And then the the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, is, is going to be the workhorse of a large amount of the vaccination of lower income countries in particular. So it's, it's achieved a huge amount uh, and also is the going to be one of the principal uh, vaccines used in the UK. Uh, it, it wasn't done in the way that a, a drug company would have done it if they'd been doing it from absolute beginning. Uh, but the difference is, again, in terms of quality, in terms of safety and in terms of actually what went through the regulators, uh, are again marginal and this has been approved in virtually and it hasn't been approved yet in the US but it's been approved in uh, across Europe uh, and multiple other regulators as well as the UK so I think this is this is a safe and effective vaccine as all the other vaccines are safe and effective vaccines you can criticize virtually any uh, study you wish to what you want is something which is a, which is safe which is highly effective and which can be used widely and, and the AstraZeneca Astra Astra ticks all three boxes. So you, you uh, hinted at this earlier, you were talking about the debate over dosing um, and the US and the UK have taken very, um, or not very different, but have taken different approaches. And I wanted to ask each of you, um, uh, particularly um, Jeff and, and, and Dan and Chris, um, you know, should the US be more flexible on things like vaccine dosing or, you know, this tension here, should, should the US be taking a more flexible approach from each of your perspectives? 
whoever wants to start. <laughs> well, I think U.S. approaches for U.S. Uh, citizens. Yeah. I, I think what I, I think uh, maybe one thing that I'll I'll um, one context I'll provide and kind of goes on what what Chris was saying is that sometimes we look at clinical research and I think there's a, a thought that it answers the truth. Right, it, that 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 it, it that it is that is infallible, and and really clinical research provides insights that allows you to make informed decisions. And so, if we if we look only at uh, at decisions and say, well, we will only do things based upon upon studies, um, th that requires a significant amount of time, um, and there are going to be questions that we cannot answer. And, and so, I think. One of the things to, to think about, and we're, we, we've seen this a lot, is you know these these clinical studies will an, will answer provide answers to certain types of questions, but the but the uh, discernment is not over just after you have an emergency youth authorization. The learning should continue, and we've seen from especially regulators, um, given our involvement with a number of another a number of programs is that there's a real focus on post-marketing safety or what they call GVP, good pharmacovigilance practices, to continue the insights that come from uh, the real world use of these, of these data. And, and I think just as important as the, as the um, prospective randomized control studies are, but you know, let's, let's, let's admit they were 30, 40, 50,000 people. And we're talking about vaccines that are gonna be given to hundreds of millions of people. There was a lot of data to be learned from that post-marketing space. And I think it's gonna be important to bring that information in and help refine the, the lessons that we have from, from the prospective studies. Dan, what do you think? Do you, do you think the US has been has hit the, the, the right spot, I guess, in terms of the flexibility and um, in some even testing, vaccine dosing? Well, I think the US tends to be a bit more conservative both from a regulatory and an implementation perspective. Uh, I, I think there really is an argument either way. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the counter argument is that, well, we know what works. We're not really sure if alternative scheduling works or not. Now, actually, there's data on it. So now, it's, now I think that that argument isn't as uh, robust. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I would, I would argue that, the, that uh, it's, it, it's probably not going to matter too soon because uh, there will likely be a lot more vaccine available a few months from now than there is today. Uh, uh, there is plans to have enough vaccine available for everyone in the U.S. by May, which is just two months away. At that point in time, then, then, then there's less of a need to stretch current vaccines uh, to cover broader population because everyone's going to be vaccinated. So obviously that sort of precludes the, con the, the, the debate, but I, I think there's actually an argument on both sides. And I think reasonable people could actually come to different, um, different positions on the exact question that, that you, you answered. Uh, but I think we all share in the overall goal of vaccinating as many people as fast as possible, uh, because that's going to immediately save lives. That's going to protect communities and that's going to prevent the emergence of more viral variants. So I think uh, I almost see that debate as a small, a relatively small detail that I think that there could be arguments on both sides, but I think we all share in the big picture goal that uh, these vaccines collectively are incredibly important. They're a triumph of science and they are, they, they are our, our most likely ticket out of the pandemic. I'll, I can make one other comment based on a previous question you asked, if I may, about what's different about, about science. And in, in my views, as someone who has been involved literally every single day since January of last year in this effort, then one thing that has been completely different about doing science for COVID-19 over the past year than ever before in my professional career has been the extent of openness and collaboration. And, and without that, then we would not have all the wonderful vaccines that we have today. And we would not be debating of how to implement them because we wouldn't have had them in the first place. 
but the, the collaborations, you know, first from the openness of the Chinese researchers to share the sequence immediately that basically led to all of the groups in the world, including my colleagues at Oxford, ourselves, and many, many, many other groups for starting vaccine development. Uh, <clears throat> the posting of manuscripts on, bio, on the archives prior to publication allows the world to see data. In some cases, it's rough. In some cases, it's not correct. In some cases, it's unrefined. But it does allow dissemination of information much, much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As well as uh, I've been part of many of the WHO working groups on assays, animal models, clinical trials that allow people to talk and share data. And the willingness of people to share unpublished data essentially as soon as it's generated in the lab for the greater good, I've never seen anything like that before. And it even continues up until the present day uh, uh, on, on not just an academic level, uh, but just this week then uh, Merck announced that they would be partnering with J&J uh, &J in the manufacturing of the J&J &J vaccine. I haven't done my homework yet, but I can't think of a uh, I, I can't think of a, another example of uh, two large pharmaceutical companies collaborating for the development of a product aimed at the global good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there are some examples, but it's an example of collaboration, and, th and there's many others as well. So, yeah. so the, the extent of collaboration, I think, has been amplified, and in almost all cases, it's really with a common good and the global pressing needs in mind. And I guess Romeo, I wanted to ask you about this in terms of the supercomputing. You know, sharing and information, sharing of information and collaboration. Are you seeing the parallels with the the companies you work with, and then Chris also with the governments? I mean, you know, we see it in science. Are we seeing it in other places? So maybe Romeo first, um, as it pertains to the work that you're doing. Sure, absolutely. I, I just I get so excited hearing these comments about the open science because it really has been such a special time to be a scientist. Um, you know, because of this just tremendous outpouring of of collaboration and sharing of data and a real change in the mindset. Um, it's the same with computing and with the data that, because a lot of what we do ingest the data that are developed by experimentalists. So it's really key that, um, you know, the, just the general access, for example, of structural data uh, is really important. Um, I also wanted to just, and I don't want to, I know you, you want, um, I think Jeff to also comment on this, but something that really struck me um, in this, during the pandemic was how um, it would help if we had better ways of, I think in general, having um, sort of the general population really sort of understand how science works in the sense that, you know, we don't really get to an end answer. We're sort of constantly, you know, science, all of science is essentially a model that is continually refined and revised as we get more data, whether that's clinical trials, whether that's understanding how the virus is actually infecting human cells, and so, um, you know, that's, that's just part of this whole process. And I think, um, you know, having somehow having a better way of communicating that such, a, such that science doesn't get vilified necessarily for like being wrong about something. It was just now we're sort of advancing our understanding. I think that could also be helpful for helping the general public sort of um, uh, sort of take in these, you know, less vaccine hesitancy and so, you know, so forth with these types of uh, public health decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just shift, I, we've been talking a lot about vaccines and I want to pick up on a question from Jonathan Erickson, who's uh, in, in the audience about sort of the role of antiviral medication treatments and what we think, what do you all think um, that role will be going forward? Um, because preventative measures aren't hundred percent preventative. Um, and so presumably we'll need new strategies. What role do you see and how, like um, what's on the horizon there, I guess, in terms of those treatments? anyone want to jump in? Shall I have a first go at that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's in, in terms of the drugs that have been proved to work so far, and uh, you know, the UK has done a lot of uh, trials on this, particularly, for example, uh, something called the recovery trial that looked at dexamethasone, uh, which is a steroid, uh, and um, some of the anti interleukin-6 uh, 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 drugs. Um, and what that demonstrates is in later severe disease, it's actually not primarily around the viral things, it's around modulating the immune response. So the later severe disease, those are the drugs that have been proved to be effective. But we don't yet have drugs that have been proved to be highly effective as antivirals. And the history of antivirals is, is much less good for acute illness than it is 
for antibiotics in uh, for bacteria uh, and for antivirals for chronic diseases like uh, HIV and hepatitis, where we do have good antivirals. So I think we should be we should be humble in the fact that we can't guarantee we're actually going to get very good antivirals, but I think there's a reasonable chance we will. And if so, they're much more likely to be useful in early disease. So in people who've actually got the initial symptoms or a very quick diagnosis. And I think what makes it possible to consider these is someone might have symptoms, rapid diagnostic tests means you can get, a, get an answer about whether they got the infection or not very quickly, and then give antivirals at an early stage of disease. And I think it's likely that's the role that antivirals will play. And it's possible that a few people may find them useful for prophylaxis if they can't have vaccines, for example, because they're immunosuppressed. Uh, but I think antivirals uh, is a hope, but it's not yet a certainty. Whereas the immune modulating drugs we already have and very good trials, including from the UK, uh, demonstrate that. So we've been talking about speed and collaboration. I want to take, a, I guess, a, a step back. And um, I think a natural question that people are asking is, why can't therapies be developed as quickly for other, other diseases with high morbidity and mortality? Why, why, why aren't we seeing that? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think that um, in some ways, the success with with the, the COVID vaccines and some of the therapies that are in development, I think it raises the question, you know, if you're able to do this type of development in this timeline, what prevents this from being done um, for other diseases? And I, I do think it's probably one of the, one of the questions that will come out of this for, for everybody involved in this, the researchers, academia, biopharma regulators. And we see actually, uh, in our work with, with a number of you know, large, mid-sized and small emerging biopharma companies that you know, after we've gotten over this initial um, mitigation of, of conducting clinical research in the setting of COVID, they're starting now to ask, what lessons did we learn from developing treatments for COVID that could be applied for other treatments, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or epilepsy or, or oncology. And so I think there, again, one of the unfortunate um, positive outcomes from this outbreak is that we have been forced to do things more quickly. The UK, for instance, was able to um, approve uh, you know, recovery in some other platform studies in the UK and just, you know, a matter of weeks and get their first patient in. I mean, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a timeline that's just absolutely unheard of. And so I, I think there, you know, once we get through this stage, I think there is gonna be a lot of, uh, of questions about what all the parties can do in, in, um, that are involved in clinical research to funnel, fundamentally improve, improve things because as bad as COVID has been, and, and there's no doubt it's been bad, but people are continuing to, to, to die of cancer and cardiovascular disease and dementia and, and, and psychiatric illness. Um, and, and we should be able to take some of these lessons learned and apply it to them because there are people in need um, in, in those indications and their needs are just as much and just as important as the needs for COVID. Yeah, if I could chime in, I don't know if Dan, you want to probably you're jumping out your, off your seat too, but I mean, I think that um, I hope that it sort of reawakens a, just a general rethinking of how you know we're investing we're investing in, in research and in the basic sciences on all those different aspects of disease and otherwise that um, will lead us to be better prepared you know for um, for future pandemics for antimicrobial resistance as well as for the current treatment of disease I mean I think the amount of money that we spend on research you know pales in comparison to many other areas of investment and maybe maybe people will be more open to rethinking that balance as a result of this. So I'll, I'll chime in. I think COVID-19 has shown us what's possible and what can be done when there's, a, when there's an enormous global need, when there is enormous global resources, when there is enormous global cooperation I think it shows us what, what is possible to do in terms of, particularly for vaccines. Um, I mean, never before have there been vaccines approved in a year. The 
shortest time frame previously was four years. And now we have multiple vaccines that have reached the finish line in approximately a year. So it shows what's possible. I don't think that it will ever go that fast again unless there's another global urgency like another pandemic of the scope. But I think certain elements will be brought in. For example, it shows the strategy of how platforms can be used for rapid vaccine development. It shows how clinical trials can be done sequentially very quickly rather than with long breaks in between. It shows the power of doing short-term but very, very large-scale clinical trials. And it shows the, the uh, speed uh, that you can move forward if you're willing to take programmatic and financial risks. I should emphasize those are not clinical safety risks, which we should never do, regardless of speed. But for programmatic and financial risks, in some cases, it, it is acceptable to accelerate the program for those reasons. It's not likely that those factors will ever converge. Again, I think maybe you know the last pandemic like this was about 100 years ago for influenza. So you know we're hoping it's not going to be the next couple of years. Um, but if the global need arises, I think the world will respond, and next time even faster. But for everything else, I think that elements of the acceleration process for COVID-19 will be brought in. I mean, I don't think that uh, there's going to be many vaccine development programs presented to company boards that it will be a 10-year development program again for anything. Um, it may not be one year, but it's probably not going to be 10 years ever again. Um, I want to ask a question, sort of picking up on this again from the audience from Peter Abbott, um, who's based in Boston. He says there's a lot that's said about the unique uh, ecosystem, the combination of world-class universities, significant venture capital, um, dynamic private sector has helped to, in particular, to this, the, bio se the biotech sector develop. And he's wondering if, like, I guess, does the potential move towards more remote working and studying threaten that model and threaten some of what we're talking about here? If anybody would want to jump in on that. Yeah, certainly bringing people together in proximity um, with divergent and complementary perspectives is, is essential for, um, for collaboration and for paradigm changing improvements. And there's no doubt that working remotely inhibits some of that, but it also, I think we've all gotten really facile at being able to work remotely. Um, you know, when, when we had the introduction here, um, you know, Michael was talking about that this event last year was canceled. And, and because I, I, don't, I don't know if the, if the event went, went virtual or not, but if it, if it did, it was probably clunky and difficult. And here we are a year later collaborating in a way that is completely different than would have been imagined a year ago. So no doubt working remotely is going to have some negative consequences of, of collaboration, um, but we shouldn't be, be close to the fact of, of what can happen. Um, you know, and I think just the dissemination of, of research that, 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 that happened uh, is kind of an example of one of the, one of the unintended consequences and, and different types of collaborations that could happen for it. So it's certainly possible that collaboration could even increase um, depending on how we adapt to this virtual and digital environment. I mean, we already see um, remote, remotely conducted clinical trials, which is, I think, is something I would, I would venture it was pretty inconceivable to think of a year ago. Um, and so, you know, are the, you know, is that are there advantages to that? Are there? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the advantages. So you know, we've we've been involved in in, in a number of these and uh, these virtual or direct to patient or decentralized clinical trials. Certainly the technology and the framework was there a year ago, but there was always a certain degree of hesitancy. Do you really want to do this? This is kind of different. And then the, the pandemic came and if you had a study ongoing, you were forced to think about which of my clinic visits and follow-up study visits can I do remote? And some of the studies, some of the vaccine studies have been done with a significant amount of, of, of remote monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's an example of, of that. The other thing I would point out that this that remote interaction uh, potentially assists with is that we know that there are certain 
collaborations and inter interactions with healthcare and access to healthcare that in, in certain ways are, um, uh, are ingrained based upon referral patterns and geographic access and things like that. And one of the advantages of going to virtual types of studies is that it allows you a potentially more diverse population to be enrolled into the studies than might have been in your classic brick and mortar type of, of clinical research. Uh, so, um, you know, the advantages of, of these virtual studies, faster, more convenient for subjects. Um, it, it can get more information actually uh, in, in many situations, and it's potentially a more diverse population pool than you would have uh, gotten otherwise. This is a great segue actually into something I wanted to talk about, which is that the pandemic has exposed a lot of these sort of structural weaknesses and a lot of disparities in public health infrastructure. And Chris, I mean, what are the top priorities in rebuilding and, and you know, addressing some of these issues in terms of, you know, is this the time to make public investments in public health infrastructure? Well, I mean, I, I, in a rather facile way, I'd say there's no time that isn't a good time to make investments in public health infrastructure. But I think what they have demonstrated uh, is that the same people get hit over and over and over again with different diseases. So in the UK, a map of who has got the highest burden of COVID is also the map of who's got the highest burden of cancer, also the map of who's got the highest burden of cardiovascular disease. And I think what this really shows is, is if we do not tackle the structural inequalities and difficulties in those communities, every time there's a medical problem, it will find them out and it will cause particular problems. So I think that is something which all, 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 we all have to take very seriously. Dan, did you want to weigh in there as well in terms of, I mean, I think from the from that from your perspective, um, what are the, the top priorities in thinking about public health infrastructure? Well, I agree with everything that's been said that, um, uh, I mean, if, you know, from the lens of vaccines, um, if vaccines don't have an outreach to the most disadvantaged communities, the most uh, third world countries, the hardest to reach people, then the vaccines are going to fail in their mission to stop the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's not only desirable, it's actually critical to remove the health disparities for, for everything, but for vaccines in particular, uh, the vaccines will not work on a population level if they're used in only a um, restricted or sporadic way. If only the uh, uh, wealthier people in wealthier nations and cities get vaccinated, we will not stop this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there is so. So, I agree with everything that's been said in general. But for vaccines, there's a there's a specific urgency to make sure that we can reach the hardest to reach people. So we're talking about access, but there's also, in terms of vaccines, there's hesitancy. And this is a question from the audience. We've seen in the US that the, that hesitancy is dropping. The UK is an outlier um, amongst its neighboring nations in terms of um, there's a, a high uh, you know, percentage of people who intend to be vaccinated. So uh, Harrison Shapiro asks, as healthcare leaders, how do you suggest we approach the subset of the population which will not voluntarily get the vaccine? Um, anybody want to take that? I can start just with a brief comment. Uh, vaccine hesitancy in the US, it, it's very substantial, but it really reached a fever peak last fall around September, October. And there were two very clear reasons for that. First, there was the knowledge that the vaccines were being developed quickly. I would say they were developed efficiently rather than developed rushed. Um, and we didn't yet have safety and efficacy data for any of the phase three trials at that point in time. The Pfizer announcement uh, came on November 9th of last year. Mm -hmm. So back in September, October, vaccine hesitancy in the US rose to exceedingly high levels because we couldn't actually say whether the vaccines were safe and effective in large populations because those data were not available yet. Mm -hmm. And coupling with that, is the political dimension that the vaccine, the whole vaccine sphere was linked with the US election. And uh, given how politically divisive our culture has become, then uh, that led to very strong feelings that were obviously not rooted in facts and science, but really, really were rooted in politics. 
So there was actually, in my view, a very good reason why vaccine hesitancy was so high last fall. In fact, I mean, I personally, I wouldn't take a vaccine until I knew that it was safe and effective and why should anybody else? So I think that, that, that there, was a very, there was a very good reason to explain that. What we've seen, at least in the US, over the last three months, three or four months with the initial vaccine rollout, we've seen vaccine hesitancy come way down and it's still dropping. And that's because of the same two reasons. First, there is no longer this link with electoral politics. And secondly, uh, we have very good data now that all of these vaccines are safe and effective. And those two features, I think, has led to a substantial decline in vaccine hesitancy. Also, as we see vaccines being rolled out to literally tens of millions of people, then that's a really good safety database now. So people who were worried about safety before, when it was given to 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 people, now it's being given to 10 million people. And, um, and so, so that's a much stronger statement about safety. So, I mean, there will always be some holdouts. There will always be a small fraction of the population that for, for many different reasons will just refuse to be vaccinated. Uh, and I personally don't think that the vaccine needs, should be compulsory. I think that uh, I think it should be good enough that I think the vast, vast majority of people should want to get it and should be given it uh, free of charge. Um, but I do think that vaccine hesitancy has come down substantially from where it was at its fever pitch in September, October of last year. And I do hope that with increasing evidence of vaccine success, not only in clinical trials, but now we're seeing data from, uh, from Israel, from the UK in particular, uh, successful vaccines on a real world basis. And I think that is that there is no better argument than that, that these vaccines are gonna save your life. And uh, I think many of the people who uh, were hesitant for vaccines before are already uh, getting vaccinated. And I think many more will over the coming few months. Um, in our final minutes, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about, again, about international collaboration. Um, and, you know, this morning, the Wall Street Journal reported that the WHO team that was investigating the origins of the virus in, in China was going to no longer going to um, issue a, an interim report as planned. And this is sort of as tension is building between Beijing and Washington over the investigation. And I guess my first question is, why is it fully important to understand the origin of COVID-19, and, and especially when you look to future outbreaks? Um, maybe, Chris, this is best, best for you. Why is, it, why is it important to understand that? I, I mean, I think it, it is going to be useful to understand the origins of, the, uh, of the, the virus for future pandemics. But for this one, to be honest, it's much more important we see how it's moved elsewhere and what's worked in different uh, settings and how we can combat it. And I think that's the near and present danger. I think, uh, you know, almost all new to the world pandemics, and this is uh, obviously the worst for a long time, the last was probably HIV, uh, originally come from animals of some form. So at some point, this has jumped the species barrier. Uh, exactly how we may find out, we may not. Uh, but much more important is what happened next and what worked to prevent it and what, what can we do to roll it back. Uh, and then I think in due course, if we can find the origins, great. But that's a, that's a second order question, and that's really just to help us understand this initial uh, trigger for, for uh, pandemics, which, as I say, is almost always going to be zoonotic. What does, I mean, does the response, I guess the international response, the tension that I mentioned, is it, does it give you, I mean, taken as a whole, does it give you hope for facing the next pandemic or the next emergency? I mean, how did... Yeah, I, I think there's much more to take away that's for hope than not for hope. If you look both at the speed of the scientific international collaboration, starting right from, uh, as colleagues uh, earlier on said, Chinese scientists sharing their work all the way through to what's been happening all the way through this pandemic, that's been extraordinarily hopeful. And the way that different nations have shared their experiences and continue to share their experiences, incredibly hopeful. What we've now got to make sure is that the vaccines are available across the world to every nation, uh, because this is absolutely a disease where everyone's at risk until no one's at risk. We've got to just make this uh, seen as a problem for the whole globe, which it is. Um, I have one last question for each of you, which is that um, over the weekend in the Financial Times, the author Yuval Harari wrote that science has turned epidemics into manageable challenges rather than uncontrollable forces of nature. And I'm wondering if each of you agree with that, and if not, what needs to be done? 
Maybe I'll start with Jeff because he's smiling. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there was a book uh, written by uh, Wall Street um, investor uh, Bernstein, I forget his first name, but it was called Against the Gods. And in the book, he, the, the prologue, uh, two books that I really say the, the prologues are fantastic. Against the Gods is one, and then The Coming Plague uh, is, is, is another, which I think is, is really apropos given our, our outcome. But in, the, in Against the Gods, he, he talks about, you know, what was the difference between the ancients and, and us today? You know, um, you know, in ancient times, they, they built great um, structures and aqueducts and, you know, were able to map the, uh, map the stars. Um, and and he, he synthesizes it down to saying that, uh, that we now are better able to quantify risk. We, we, have a, we, have a, we have a language, a statistics that, that allows us to, to quantify risk. And in, in that way, once you start, can start to quantify things, uh, it allows you to get to literally your arms around it and to, and to move it out of the realm of the gods or nature acting irrationally into something that has some degree of, of predictability. And, and I, I, I don't know if, if we've trans transformed outbreaks and pandemics into something that are manageable um, because you know, this, this outbreak has really paralyzed the world in, in many ways. And hard, hard to say that we've, we've been able to navigate it. I'm not sure that we've done a great job at, 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 at managing it, but I do think that the science and the collaborations and just the, 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 the brain power that we have around the world has allowed us to quantify and understand, you know, I'm thinking particularly of, you know, work that uh, uh, Romy has done with, you know, taking all these interleukins and how they, these inflammatory process, how they uh, all work together in, in, in ways. Um, it, it, it makes it less scary. And I think if you look at where we are today, where compared to where we were 12 or 13 months ago, the number of cases is higher now than it was a year ago. More people are dying today than it was a year ago, but it feels more manageable because we have a way to understand it through science and through, through statistics. And that's, I think, how I would look at, at, at that. Dan, do you think we're in a better, uh, in a better place going, looking on the horizon of um, oncoming challenges? I think that in the future, when historians write about the COVID-19 pandemic, and they will for the rest of our lives, then there's gonna be a whole lot of terrible things that are a whole lot of horrible stories that are gonna be reported, but the shining light is going to be science and medicine. And all the, all the arms of science that have contributed to our understanding, our treatment and our prevention of this disease that have occurred so quickly certainly makes it into something that we are managing. Now, could we do it better? Of course. So we would, we, we, we would of course want to do it better, manage it better, develop treatments and vaccines faster. Um, but we're a far cry from saying this is one of the uh, 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 uncontrolled forces of nature because uh, uh, if nothing else, then it is likely that these vaccines will control it. And that's a product of science. Chris, what about you? What do you think um, in terms of the, the, the advances made in science, but also given the, the political and geopolitical context we've talked about um, looking forward, do you feel like we've made a leap? Oh. <laughs> I think that um, the science is steadily improving on this. And so far we have, there are very, very few infections. We've not found a way through eventually but you know, pandemics hit us and they do a huge amount of damage. If you look at COVID, if you look at HIV, very, very many people have died. Uh, so I think the idea we can just tame them just like that is wrong. Uh, and actually we were very lucky that vaccines worked so rapidly. We still don't have an HIV vaccine. We might not have had a, had a COVID vaccine. It was not a given. So I think although science would eventually have found a way through, uh, we were fortunate that it was a relatively quick response and very many people we're not, not gonna have access to vaccines for a while. And I think therefore we should, you know, if you look at this as a global problem, uh, COVID is going to be, you know, it's gonna be a very long time before it feels this is a wholly tamed environment. So science, yes, it can de-risk it. 
uh, it's been remarkably successful at doing this. And I think uh, the international collaboration on this, including, I have to say, very strongly uh, between the UK and the USA, uh, have been uh, amazing. Uh, but uh, there's a long way to go. Many people, I'm afraid, are still going to die of COVID before this has got to the point any of us would see this is down to a manageable risk. And Romy, I wanted to end on you because you're working on the on the the sort of bleeding edge of all of this, and I'm I'm curious, I guess, what do you think um, we'll be working on in ten years or twenty years, and how is the the current um, you know the current state of your field sort of setting it up for that? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so uh, you know, I also you know just like agreeing with what everyone has said. Um, Certainly, this pandemic has exposed strengths. Uh, it has exposed significant weaknesses still. I would hope very much that lessons that we learn from this, you know, that we'll be able to help to be more prepared for, of course, the next pandemic, which we'll have, Dan, I think we'll have it certainly actually in our lifetimes, um, but maybe of different types. Um, you know, I think, and also the intersection of, uh, and this sort of emergence of more um, sort of computing also with AI, there's certainly a lot to give there. So 10 to 20 years, you know, we'll probably be, hopefully, we'll probably be grappling, you know, with things like climate change, uh, which are gonna be, which is obviously something that um, is going to really shake the table, you know, in terms of how we live life and, um, but hopefully, you know, I, I am optimistic, but, you know, I do also, like many of us here, see the significant weaknesses that make us, I think, um, still uh, have cause for concern and still cause for advocacy for some of these core uh, activities that hopefully can happen in the interim between when we're actually faced directly with that challenge, you know, to try to help us sort of be more prepared or even sort of steer off these sorts of um, potentially sort of more catastrophic events that humanity will face. I want to thank you all. I want to echo the deputy ambassador. I know you're all very busy and I really appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your insights and your expertise with us. Um, and thank you to everyone watching online. Have a great rest of your day.